every generation has its own challenges. And what I'm seeing with the challenges that the youth are facing, there's a moral bankruptcy. We have spent the moral capital of that greatest generation, and we have not replaced it with something substantial. The students are on a sea of opinions with a million options and no compass to guide them. They're being tossed to and fro. And that is reflected even amongst Christian students, even amongst the leadership that I see. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Zan Tyler podcast, where our goal is to help you thrive on your homeschool journey. Before we begin today's podcast, I just wanted to remind you to subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen or watch, including YouTube, and leave us a good review if this podcast has encouraged you. Leaving a review also helps other homeschool parents like you find our podcast. And as always, you can follow me on Instagram and Facebook. My guest today is a dear friend, Bill Jack. Bill is a co-founder of Worldview Academy, and through the camps and ministry of Worldview Academy, Bill has spoken to tens of thousands of parents and students around the nation and impacted their lives significantly. I know because I am one of them. Through all of his work, Bill's passion is to raise up a generation who has the vision to reach their culture with the gospel. Bill is the father of three grown children and two grandchildren. His wife, Tabby, who you will learn more about throughout this podcast, went to be with the Lord about five years ago. Bill's story isn't complete without talking about Tabby. So stay tuned. You don't want to miss this conversation. When my family started our homeschooling journey, there were so many decisions to make, but one of our best decisions was choosing to use BJU Press Homeschool. I've never seen my kids so excited to get textbooks before. I'm amazed by how interesting and interactive the lessons are. My kids actually look forward to them. We use the online video lessons for all our courses, but I know some families choose to teach from the textbooks. What I love is that I can trust BJU Press to uphold our values. The Bible and biblical principles are woven throughout each subject. I'll admit, I was a bit nervous when I started homeschooling, but I've found a wonderful online community of other BJU Press homeschool families and consultants. The Homeschool Hub also makes my job easier. I can set up our schedules and rearrange them with just a few clicks. On the dashboard, I can see each of my kids' progress, and the assignments page shows me quickly what's ready for me to check or grade. I'm glad my son's biology assignments are automatically graded. BJU Press Homeschool has given us the tools and confidence to homeschool our children. For more information, do what I did and visit the BJU Press Homeschool website or talk with your local HomeWorks consultant. Bill, thank you so much for being with us today. I cannot wait for people to hear from you. I'm just a big, <laughs> big, you're a dear friend, but I'm a big fan. <laughs> well, Zan, you must have had several cancellations and couldn't figure out who to, who to ask. And so, <laughs> I'm delighted to be with you today. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you. you so much. It is so good to see you too. We've had some technology issues. Thank you for hanging in there with us. How did Paul ever preach the gospel without technology? <laughs> I <Question. don't> know. <laughs> Maybe the lack of technology made it easier for him. I don't know. <laughs> they um, have. So I've also got a tooth issue going on. I had a crown fall off last night. So for those of you who are watching, if it looks like I'm talking out of the right side of my mouth, I am um, because it's quite painful. So we're going to uh, try to enjoy this interview anyway. But first, Bill, tell us a little bit about your life, you know, how you came to the Lord, um, how you met Tabby, uh, your family, those types of things. Well, I was raised in Southern Illinois, nowhere near Chicago, about 100 miles southeast of St. Louis in a small town called Heron, Illinois. Um, my dad was a businessman there. Uh, he owned a small lumberyard. And um, I grew up there. Even when I went to college, I lived in town, so I commuted. So I never lived outside of uh, the town of Heron, about 10,000 people, until I moved to Colorado in 1982. And what brought me here was that I taught for 10 years 
in the high school from which I was graduated, which was a weird experience, teaching with teachers who once taught me. Yes, yes. Yes. I'm sure you never caused any trouble either for any of them. <laughs> no, no I, was, I was a model student. But you see them differently in the teacher's lounge than you do in the, in the classroom. Yeah. So a youth ministry came to town, and, and they wanted to have Bible clubs on campus. They called them academic Bible clubs. Uh, or theistic education clubs at that time. And they taught worldview. In fact, they, they showed uh, Francis Schaeffer's How Should We Then Live series. Oh, boy, that was really had a profound impact on Joe and me. Whoa. It yeah. did me. I had to sit through it three times before I understood what this guy in Nickers was talking <laughs> <What's>... about because <laughs> no. I was so secularized in my thinking. I was a Christian, uh, raised in a Christian family, um, and everybody knew I was a Christian, but I was I was schizophrenic. I, I loved Jesus here, but I was trying to think secularly. And so that's that was the problem I was facing. I love the way you put that because Joe and I were really committed believers. I I remember watching those videos like it was yesterday. We were married, we had a young baby, and I was an economics major headed to law school before Joe proposed and as I say ruined my life plan, but gave me a much better one and I loved the study of economics. And I can remember, I can't remember if it was Francis Schaefer or the guy moderating the video series said something about a biblical worldview of economics. I thought, there is not. There is no such thing as that because I grew up in the church. I committed my life to Christ in high school. Somebody somewhere would have told me that. And as I watched that series, it was so life-changing because I realized that the Bible spoke on all of academics. And here I was, this young mom, and I thought, I don't know how to think like a Christian. I mean, I don't know how to see how the Bible impacts all of life, not just our spirituality. I don't know how to say that. So I can't believe you're saying that because that, I mean, I made that commitment right then that I never wanted my kids to have to unlearn everything they had learned and relearn. But I, so, so as always, you speak right into my heart and I took right over the conversation. Go right, go, go for it. <laughs> well, I recall, you know, I would walk into church on Sunday or Wednesday night prayer meeting and I would put my, my mind, my intellect on the shelf in the foyer. I'd walk into my classroom Monday through Friday and I would put my heart, my faith in the bottom drawer of my desk. I knew if these two ever came together, I would explode. And, yes. and so I, I was compartmentalized. For example, I never mentioned in my literature class the most influential piece of literature in Western civilization. First book printed on a movable type printing press. First book read in outer space. International bestseller. To be a bestseller, I must sell one million copies and be translated into six languages. This book had been translated into over 1,100 languages and dialects and sold over a billion copies. Well, what, what book did I, did I ignore in my lit class? The Bible, of course. That's academically absurd. So I was, I was compartmentalized. I was, I was schizophrenic. And so uh, it took me about two years to rethink my view of education from a biblical perspective. And so then I started working with this youth ministry called the Caleb Campaign. It was a creationist youth ministry designed to assist Christians students and teachers in the public schools who wanted to share their faith legally, effectively, and aggressively. And so eventually that brought me to Denver. I resigned my position as a teacher, and we came out to uh, to Denver and did that for 14 years. Now, were you married at that point? Were you and Tammy yes. married at that point? Yeah, we were married. I got married the day after my last final in college. Both our families belong to the Crab Orchard Boat and Yacht Club. <laughs> Pretty impressive, right? Yes, well, very it was, it was main. It was mainly <laughs> pontoon boats and and, and John boats, fishing boats. <laughs> and and uh, my mother saw her in the clubhouse, and she said, uh, "You need to meet my son." So my mother actually introduced us, and uh, my wife was the most gorgeous woman I've ever met, both uh, physically and spiritually, and and uh, she. She would take my breath away, and, it, and every every look, and she had the ability to um, 
cut you like a razor with with her insights and her critique. And while you were bleeding, you would thank her and smile because she was she had that she had that ability. So she was my uh, greatest fan and my my best critic. The only time I got in trouble is when I didn't listen to her. So. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be but, in trouble with Tabby. <clears throat> no, but no. She's, she's such a sweetheart. Yeah, I, I married way above myself. <laughs> but anyway, we moved to Colorado, and at that time we had uh, one son. We now have three three children, all grown, and I have two grandchildren. But uh, about twenty, about thirty years ago, three other guys and I founded Worldview Academy, and it is a Christian leadership training program for students 13 to 18. And we do mainly camps across the country during the summer months, week-long camps. We train them in three things, in worldviews, evangelism, and apologetics, and servant leadership skills. Those are the three emphasis that we have. And we have faculty that, that donate their time and give up their summers to travel. Okay, wait a minute. We got to back up just a little bit. So we we went from the Caleb Project to Worldview Academy. So tell me a little bit about. I mean, I know Randy and Jeff. So tell me how y'all met, and really how you decided. I mean, this was a big undertaking to start. It, it for was. Y'all to quit your day jobs and start things like this. So I've never heard the story. I want to know. I mean, inquiring minds want to know how. Right. Um, you got from point A to Z. <laughs> well, I'm not sure they want to know, but it, it, and I'll try to make it brief. But Todd Kent had the vision for uh, training students. He he had uh, gone to Summit Ministries down in Manitou Springs here in Colorado. And uh, he went to the founder of that, David Noble, and, he, and everybody called him Doc. And he said, Doc, he said, I want to do this for younger students because Summit starts at age 16. And Todd said, I want to do this for younger students in Texas, where Todd was from. And Doc said, yeah, you can do that. You just need to take one of our guys with you. And at that time, Jeff Baldwin was uh, the main researcher and did most of the writing for the Understanding the Times textbook. And so uh, Doc said, take take Jeff. And um, so Todd uh, knew Jeff. Jeff knew me because I'd done some volunteer work while working for the Caleb campaign with Summit. And then Todd knew Randy Sims. So the four of us, Todd, Randy, Jeff, and I, got together and we did this on the side for a couple of years. And we would do these maybe two or three times during the summer. And we kind of looked at each other and we said, you know, I'm not sure I like you, but this seems to be working. <laughs> and and uh, so we came from very diverse backgrounds and and denominational perspectives, but we we agreed on the essentials of Christianity, what C.S. Lewis calls mere Christianity. And so that's that's how we started. And eventually we grew to the point where right before the, the so-called pandemic, and we can talk about that later, but <laughs> we had about 2,100 students over the summer. We're now back up to about 1,800. We've had not that we shut down, but we, we hold these at universities and colleges across the country. Right. And because that affords us the academic aspect, the housing and the, the food aspects. And so we do a week at colleges and universities. And during that period, they shut down, not because we wanted to, but they had to. And so we were put on hold for about a year. We have these camps all over the country. You can go to to our website, worldview.org, and find out where one is close to you. And we did it purposely to take the cost of travel out of the cost of camp. Camp is not inexpensive. It mm-hmm. It is. Right. Nobody gets paid <clears throat> from the tuition that people pay for camp except our executive director and a registrar. So all of the rest of us raise our own support. But camp is still not cheap. And so to take the cost of travel, which is almost prohibitive when you add that into the cost of camp, we take it around to various locations throughout the United States. And so, so we've have, we have a camp in, in New Hampshire and we have a camp in Washington State and Texas and Southern California. 
in Georgia and South Carolina. So we are all over the map. So my sons went, Ty and John went, um, when it was first starting in South Carolina. So would that have been like 95, maybe? 96, let's let's maybe. not start putting years on those, okay? <laughs> let's let's try to put date. <laughs> yeah, that, well, it was yeah. really impactful for my sons. And I love well. the way that you actually take kids into a town square, so to speak, and teach them how to share the gospel. You know, cold call. And, that's one of the that's one of the uniquenesses of of what we do. It's they're in class twenty nine hours out of the week. It's it's not for the faint of heart. So it's an academic program. It's not a fun junkie camp. It's not a come get your unsaved friend saved camp. There are mm-hmm. camps for that, but this is this is a leadership camp. But one of the unique aspects that we have, as you pointed out, is that on Wednesday afternoon, no matter where we are, we take our students to either a college campus or a downtown area, and we have them engage people in conversation. We have them share their faith. We have them engage on a question about worldview. That's that's what transforms camp. I mean, they're getting a lot of truth between Sunday evening and Wednesday morning, and you can kind of see it on on some of them. They're going, ooh, I'm, I'm pretty smart for being a Christian. And then they hit the campus and they engage with a professor who is used to trying to tie Christian students in knots, and they realize their Sunday school answers don't suffice. Or they give a clear gospel, and it breaks their heart when somebody turns and rejects it and walks away. Or they fumble through the gospel, and they watch the Holy Spirit use their fumbling words to draw somebody to the Lord. And so they come back, and they go, I need this. And that's when grace kicks in. That's why we say it's truth and grace. It's truth and grace. That 45-minute practicum really transforms camp. And I think that's one of the unique aspects of Worldview Academy is the practical application at camp. It is the most popular thing about camp. Students always say, "Can can we spend more time out here? You would think they would say, okay, let's check this off the list and go back to the classroom <laughs> where it's comfortable and safe. And right. uh, But I just I just think it's masterful that you do that. For people, you know, tell us what the 29 hours of classroom work is. Well, you know, their impressions in the seats are almost permanent by the end of the week. You know? <laughs> but again, we, we cover worldviews, comparative worldviews. We talk right, about when you say apologetics. Tell us, worldviews. Tell us, tell me. Well, there, there are four four categories of worldviews that we break them down into: theism, atheism, or atheism, pantheism, and polytheism. And underneath each of those umbrellas, you find various denominations, if you will, just like you do in Christendom. But you can even break them down further. It's either theism or it's secularism. And under secularism, you have everything from Marxism to ethical culture, to Hinduism, to New Age. You have all of the other worldviews, all the other world religions falling under secularism. Under theism, you have Christianity, you have Islam, and you have Judaism. And so those two camps are equally divided. And with, with under theism, Christianity is the only one that will support the weight of reality. And we encourage students to ask questions. It's not wrong to question authority. It depends on their heart attitude. You know, we're not encouraging them to do gotcha questions, but to investigate to the truth demands inspection. And so we believe that that because Christianity is true everywhere in economics, as well as in a personal relationship, that it demands inspection. And what happens too often in, I will say, youth groups is that there's no deep dive into the hard questions that students have. You know, we try to entertain students in our youth groups too often into the kingdom. Hey, we're going to have pizza and we're going to have fun and come and we're going to have a great time. And so the problem is we try to entertain them into the kingdom. 
Jesus didn't have a discipleship one-on-one class. Jesus didn't have a pizza party. He said, come follow me. He said, watch what happens when I curse this fig tree. Watch what happens when the woman touches the hem of my garment. And he said, now you guys go out and do the same thing. And they went out and they came back and they go, woo, even the demons are subject to us. He said, wait a minute, you still don't get it. Sit down, let me talk to you. So again, it's the, we teach them, take them out, have them do it, come back, and then we teach them again. So it's that so model the, that I think is good. So the 29 hours, so they're talking about worldview all the time? Nope. There's there's leadership. They have uh, leadership practicums and on Monday afternoon. We have the evangelism practicum on Wednesday afternoon. They have some team building exercises that they do. But in the classroom, they're they're taking a look at um, one of the favorite lectures is by Mike Shutt, who's now the executive director, and it's Worldviews in a Lifeboat. And he talks oh, about... Oh, I heard him give that talk at the National yeah. Leadership Conference. It was great. Isn't that an amazing talk? Yes, yes. It's all about cannibalism, you know? <laughs> <It's>, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It is. It seriously is. And, and and so, again, we have very gifted speakers. I love the guys that, that come and are faculty because I, I get to hang around with guys who are much smarter than I and much more creative and talented. And so I just steal a lot of stuff from them. But <laughs> they have two skills. I mean, there, there are guys who have great content. They do not have the ability to, to communicate that to 13 to 18 year olds. Mm-hmm. We have, we, I know guys who are very good in communicating with 13 to 18 year olds, but they have no content. No content. Mm-hmm. So we have guys who have both of those. They have the ability to take very difficult issues such as homosexuality, sexuality, identity, and bring it down, put the cookies on the bottom shelf within reach but we're not dumbing down the issue. We're dealing with tough issues, but we're communicating them in such a way that that students can grasp and and filter it through scripture properly. So So we we deal a lot with foundational issues such as Mm -hmm. origins. We deal a lot with the issue of sexuality. We deal a lot with leadership skills. There's a whole uh, series of talks that that one of our guys does on the reliability of scripture. Uh, so we are committed to scripture being the yardstick by which we decide what is right and what is wrong. Randy Sims wrote a book called The Greatest Among You. He, Randy Sims was the executive director. It was not his autobiography, even though he may think it was. No, I'm just, I'm teasing. <laughs> Greatest Among You, of course. Means- I love Randy. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, and it's a small book because it's all about him. No, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. <laughs> it deals with five principles of leadership, uh, five the five pillars of leadership. So, Bill, tell me a little bit about the leadership portion of what you do at Worldview Academy and what that practicum would look like. As I said, we, we do practicums. It's not just sit them in a classroom, pop their heads open and pour information in. We train them, then we take them out and have them do it. So on Monday afternoon, they're doing a leadership practicum, which is some team building skills based on the morning lecture on the five pillars of leadership, which are based on Randy Sims' book, uh, The Greatest Among You which is an excellent, excellent study that for adults and for students on the five pillars of leadership. So throughout the week, they're practicing those five pillars of putting into practice those in various ways, either in a practicum, small groups. And that's really what makes camp sing. We have college staff who travel with us all summer. They, they give up their time. They, they really are the juice of camp, if you will, because they're with students 24-6. They, they eat with them. They debrief with them. They're in lectures with them. So we have college staff who are assigned to 8 to 12 students, about the same age group. And they, they process what they hear in lectures uh, with them. They wrestle with these tough questions. 
our faculty sit down with with students at meals, so we're very accessible. And so there's a lot of interaction, a lot of time spent answering questions, dealing with issues that students are facing. What I'm seeing in, in youth culture over the 30 years I've been doing this, well, 40, well, we won't even talk about how long I've been. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> But in my time, in the past seven or eight years, our faculty have noticed that there has been a shift in in the youth culture. We're, we're dealing we're dealing with this level in the youth culture, not this level. We're not dealing with your average youth group student. We're dealing with those who, for for the most part, have committed their lives to Christ, and they want to be leaders. So they come knowing what this is about. But we've noticed over the past few years that there's been a shift in, in the thinking of, of youth, in the, in the youth culture. Maybe I can illustrate it this way. Several years ago, we had a hailstorm that came through where I live, and it just thrashed the house. I had to get a new roof. But as part of the process, all the screens were, were just ripped to shreds. And as I said, I spent a lot of time as a, in my youth at my dad's lumberyard, and my job was to repair screens. And so I, I repaired scores of those. And so um, I decided to do that part myself. And I went into the garage and got, got the screen, got all the stuff, and I got a tool that I had used when I was a high school student back in the 60s, and I had repaired myriads of these screens at my dad's lumberyard. And I, as I was repairing these screens, I thought, I've got, I've got my dad's old radio. I wonder if it still works. I plugged it in. Nothing. And then I realized it was so old, it had tubes in it. So it took a while to warm up, kind of like me in the morning, okay? <laughs> so, but as it played and as I was working on these screens, all these memories flooded back about my time as a youth at my dad's lumberyard, watching him as a Christian run his business. And I can still hear his words echo in my ear. I learned more from watching him conduct his business and lead a Sunday school class than I did from sermons. And it made me fairly nostalgic, okay, for for the time in in our history when when things were oh simpler perhaps, or yes, when when there simpler, were dependable yeah. tools that we could rely on, when there was integrity. But you know what? We shouldn't just get nostalgic because every generation has its own challenges, and what I'm seeing with the challenges that the youth are facing, I think there are four challenges to the future of our nation that they have. One is there's a moral bankruptcy. We have spent the moral capital of that greatest generation, and we have not replaced it with something substantial. The students are on a sea of opinions with a million options and no compass to guide them. They're being tossed to and fro. And that is reflected even amongst Christian students, even amongst the leadership that I see. We do a, a bridge year program as well down in Canyon City, Colorado. It's a two-semester program for students who are just out of high school who want to get grounded in their faith before they hit college or their career path. They can receive up to almost 30 hours of transferable credit through uh, a, a university that we have a partnership with. So they can get their humanities basically out of the way. But again, it's practical. It's held at a former abbey, but we don't issue cowls and we don't make them <laughs> memorize Gregorian chants, okay? We're not cloistering them. They have to be involved in the community. And as part of that, we take them out to a park right across the street from the high school periodically, and we have them engage high school students in conversations and share their faith. And one of the first times we were out there, there was a, a police officer 
who was assigned just to just to be on patrol there to to watch for stuff. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I went over and started talking to him and explained to him what we were doing. And he said, he said, these students need this. He said, they really need this. And, and I said, well, uh, what do you mean? He said, I, I've went, gone to pastors in, in town and said, hey, you know, this is a great opportunity for you to share, share the gospel with students here and send people here. I said, well, did they respond? And he, he looked at the ground and he shook his head no. The problem is that, that it's not that students, that non-Christians don't want to hear about spiritual things. We just don't think they do. They're interested in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. That's such a great point. Yes. Okay? Yes. But we just don't think they are. And it, and it broke my heart that we have not engaged the culture. We've retreated. We've created our own ghettos. And so there's a moral bankruptcy in the culture. Because we're not advancing on the culture, we're retreating from culture. But there's also confusion. That's the the big thing that I see within Christendom. And it it centers around the whole issue of identity. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's that's illustrated probably best by the, by, uh, the movie that's the most popular movie this year. And one of the top grossing movies of all time so far, and that's Barbie. In fact, Barbie was listed in Time's top 10 people of the year. Okay, now wait a minute, wait a minute. Barbie (laughs) is one of the top 10 persons of the year. She's a fictional character, right? Right, And yet, that illustrates the confusion we have in our culture. That movie is a worldview rich movie from from even the the lyrics were the song the theme song by billy eilish i believe it was at, at one point in the in the film the song goes something like this I, i'm not sure what i was made for what was i made for i don't know how to feel once i could fly but now i can just fall that the the whole theme of the movie centers around narcissism and death it 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 is it is a sad movie i would not recommend it to anyone but i I went to see it twice okay i i know i know first time (laughs) i went i went to the matinee and i thought nobody will be there but women came in in groups okay well, I happen to get a, a big drink, and I'm sitting there in the film, and I go, ah, I, I got I got to, I got to, and so I had to get up, and I had to walk in front of all of these women <laughs> to go, I just took my man just card out, I just ripped it up, I, I threw it up in the air, okay? But I actually went back to see this twice. It was such a rich film. It's depressing. It is a diatribe against everything the Bible says. I'm convinced about that. It is radical feminism to the hilt, but it shows the bankruptcy of that worldview as well. It it, it is so deep and rich in that sense, but there's such confusion to the point where there is a trans Barbie character in the film that's the confusion that we see in youth when they're bombarded with that when they're inundated with the secular worldview the view that says there may or may not be a god but even if god is he's irrelevant in economics in history in art in science and entertainment then we create these schizophrenic christians as i was So there's a moral bankruptcy, there's a confusion, there's biblical illiteracy. Well, for sure. I can't tell. We see that more now. 
Thanks for being with us today for part one of this two-part series where Bill Jack and I discuss the powerful significance of teaching our children to embrace a biblical worldview. Be sure to tune in for part two next week as we continue this vital discussion. You can find Bill at worldview.org or billjack4987 at gmail.com. And you can find me, as always, at zantyler.com. If you need a consultant for an excellent curriculum based on a biblical worldview, visit homeschoolhelp.com slash map, click on your state, and find a consultant in your area. As always, thank you for spending your time with us today, and may God continue to bless your family. Bye.